Check, check, check. Check. Hello. Oh my god. Okay. Hello, hello. Holy cow. It's freaking so- Okay. Yeah. Yet again. You wanna know what the problem is? I know y'all are gonna laugh at this. It's cause I use Safari. You know why? Cause I got hooked on it, man. I'm sorry. I started with Safari forever ago. It's- I- it was always a mistake. But I- it just- I became embedded into the- the system of Safari. But Safari is such a crap browser. So, I guess... Uh, YouTube, um... Not surprisingly, decided, um... Hey, we're not gonna work with Safari, but we'll work with Chrome. So I pulled up Chrome and... Worked like a charm! So, anyway, hi! Here I am, hello. Welcome to, <laughs> I don't know if that worked, to the Gary Williamson program. Hello guys, glad to see you here. Uh, yep, as, as the title and the name imply and the description, ask me any music questions. I shall answer them. Um, hope you guys are doing well. Um, I, yeah, I rarely stream on YouTube. It seems like I run into some issue every single time. Um, but here I am. Here I be. My back is killing me. I'm glad you all are here. Thank you for your patience. Um, oh, gosh. Yeah, my back is... My back is... But, dude, this chair... Here, I'll, I'll answer everybody's totally non-existent question. Um, get a good, get a good chair for, for music production. I'll just answer this one since none of you guys are going to ask it. Get a good chair, because, um, I've got a bad one, and I really, in fact, uh, this might be my next purchase, is getting a chair, because my back has been hurting a lot lately. I think it might be because of this. Um, but, uh, but yeah. Alright, let me throw a softball. We're gonna start with Turquoise's question. Let me throw a softball at you. How'd you get into music? I was born into a musical family, um, so I don't really know a time in which I wasn't um, doing music. Uh, I started... I can consciously remember starting to write my own music when I was about four years old. Um, and... Uh, yeah, it never... It just it kind of was... Move forward from there. Um... I would definitely say, um, that, um, I think I was really into music and, and doing music, writing music from a very young age, age, uh, as well as, um, as well as drumming. Drumming was another big thing for me, which that's part of music, but I just mean like, in terms of instru instruments that I played. I, I got into drumming probably when I was about seven or eight years old. Um, and d drumming has been a very, very integral part of my, uh, of my songwriting process. I think it might be part of why I love Dave Grohl so much because Dave Grohl's talked about how he hears, um, how he hears music uh, from a drummer's perspective. Um, and uh, that's actually very, uh, it's true for me. Um, you know, he talks about how, um, uh, you know, with like ever, ever long, he, it's play like, or however it goes. Right. But he talks about how he hears it as like, do do gap 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 like a like a like a, a kick kick snare thing bum ba da 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 right i think i i hear in a in a little bit of a different approach i hear the same way where like uh for instance uh like let's say not so hard to find old old track of mine um the way i play it and i played a lot of music this way where i will play an octave thing i'll do something like this Um, that's not... There we go. 
actually, hold on. So what I'm going to do here, I'm going to switch over. Here we go. I'm going to switch over here. Hello. Um, and pull up my keyboard. Right, so you see how I'm going... So I literally hear that as kick, snare, kick, snare, boom, ka, boom, ka. Right? So, um, anyway, that massive rabbit trail. Um, but I do think the song that, um... And I, I, I know I've talked about this before. The song that I think, like, solidified my my love for music and my love um, for... Uh, and, and, like, really making me kind of go that direction in my life was Scream by Michael Jackson. Um, that that song is kind of the game changer. Now, I would play... I know that constant ID crap happens anyway. I'm a little scared of Jackson's estate in particular... Um, I feel like they would be ones to flag me for no good reason. Um, but that song, its production, everything about Scream by Michael Jackson might be one of the most important songs of all time for me. Um, I'd love to get into why, but that's a, that's a conversation for another time. Um, what's my favorite BPM that associates... Twister TH asks, what's my favorite BPM that associates with your favorite songs? Oh gosh, I don't think there's a favorite BPM... Um, I definitely think in terms of, like, funky stuff, um, generally anywhere between, like, 80 and 110 BPM is, like, a really, th that's, like, a sweet spot. Um, but you, then you've got people like Lewis Cole who do, like, r like breakneck speed music, but it's also super funky, you know what I mean? So, it, it's, I don't, I don't know if there's any particular BPM... I'm never really thinking about that. I, you know, if anything, you know, if, if I'm writing a song, I never think about the BPM. Um, the, the only point which I think about the BPM is once I've already like felt it out, then I'll be like, okay, what BPM is this that I need to dial in for the, for the, for logic. But I'm never, I'm never thinking about the BPM. Um, but I guess like if, if I were to think about like, a sweet spot for like funk music for instance i think a lot of times it ends up being somewhere around 80 to 110 115 but again it's there's no rules there it's there it's absolutely yeah it's 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 kind of it's any man's game struggling with motivation on music uh excuse me i need to start bruce hansen is asking uh i'm struggling with motivation on music and continuing a project and not just dipping and running I don't even want to start a new project. Just hard to continue. Any tips? Um, oof. Number one, I definitely get it. Uh, I There are a lot of points in which I, I just have to push through. Um, let, let me tell you this. You will feel so much better if you get it done. Um, I know that's that. There's no, like, I'm not able. I don't know if I'm able to give you, like, a, like, this is like the trick you should use. Um, I definitely think um, finding inspiration by just experiencing new things is really helpful uh, in getting creative juices flowing. However that may be, whether that means you just go out, you watch a show, you go meet up with people, you go to a new place. I don't know. You find a new artist. You you just you consume a lot of different stuff uh, and that can really help get the creative creativity going and oftentimes at least for me that can help motivate me to be like oh now i know what i can do with this right um but in terms of like if you're just like oh my gosh i i can't manage to get myself to get this done for me honestly a lot of the time uh what it's been has just been pushing myself to like to understand i will feel so much better and not only that but a lot of times i will feel proud of and happy with what i end up with a lot of times working on stuff can be painful, but being able to look at what you created is such a wonderful thing um, that I think a lot of times just the motivation of knowing this is like of knowing that if I finish it, I will feel better about it and I will and I will 
feel good that I had it done, um, that'll help a lot. And I think it's very important. I think it's very, very important. I've, t I've talked about this before. People ask like, what's like a really important like thing f from an early stage that I should know. I think it's very, very important that if you start a project, you finish it. Now, that's not the same as, if you are overly ambitious and you decide I want to make a 30 track uh, freaking, you know, art piece, um, and you've just started out, listen, man, it's your own fault for being that ambitious. Uh, if you can pull it off, great, but most of the time, you know, I've, I've learned that um, that is not the case, and people end up realizing, oh, I'm way in over my head here. Um, so I would, I, I definitely advise start with just small things. Give yourself small goals. Give yourself, don't look at the biggest picture at the moment. Like, know you have that big picture, but don't worry about it. Just focus on the small things and getting a certain small thing done every, every day. Um, and, and just focus on achieving those small goals and just make sure you get things finished it's so important that if you start a project if you start um yeah if you start a project you finish it uh, because that will help you mentally it'll help wire you to actually get things done um because i've i've, I've known so many creative people that will just get super distracted and then they immediately it's just they they go to something else and they've got all this create creativity and it's really great, but they have to be, you know, it's, and it's a struggle for us creative people, but you have to be able to control yourself to just focus and get this done. Um, you know, and, and that doesn't even necessarily mean like get the whole song done, but you need to have a, like maybe a goal for that day. This is what I need to get done with this song, with this thing today. Then, you know, tomorrow I'll do this, yada, yada. But the ultimate goal needs to be, I've started this project, I'm going to finish it. Um, Cause that will really help wire your brain um, to actually get that stuff done in the future. Um, here's a question I always wanted to, sorry, I keep doing this. Uh, Shashwat Bhushan, I'm so sorry if I screwed up that name. Uh, here's a question I always wanted to ask composers. How do you come up with your own unique melodies? Oh gosh, uh, that's a, a giant can of worms and also kind of hard for me to answer. I definitely think it's very important to consume a lot of music that, again, you love that like speaks to you um, and listen to those melodies. Um, you know, it, you don't even necessarily need to like very technically analyze them. You can, That's that helps a lot of people, I think. Um, but just listen to almost like, the way I would think about it is the shape of the melody. Is it, you know, um, you know, is it doing something like, right? Or is it doing something like, that's almost like it's doing this, right? Or is it going, right? Right, something like that. I see things as shapes, so that's just my immediate, um, uh, metaphor um, but like <clears throat> that's one way you could look at it uh, and I think maybe that's part of what can help me shape a melody no pun intended um, is just that but I think a lot of it is just you consume uh, at least in my for me personally um, it's different for everybody I hope that's clear I, anything I say here is not like a here's like the rule right Th this is just what works for me somebody else some another very respectable brilliant composer could answer a totally different way um but for me i think a lot of it is just listening to uh, I, I think a lot it, what it has been is i've consumed a lot of music i've consumed a lot of different melodies over the course of my life and there's just certain things that my ear hears um i i think and and also a lot of it is just experience the more i i write the more maybe to some extent it comes a little more naturally to me um i do think a lot of the time a lot of the melodies that i hear uh it kind of goes either way sometimes i just immediate i kind of let my 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 fingers lead me you know i kind of let i just kind of 
I hear, you know, I could, I don't know, like, um, let me go up. I don't know. Right? And that's just me letting my my <clears throat> my hands pretty much just go like, okay, I've just come up with this simple chord progression. Now, how do I want to sing? How do I want this to? I, and I don't, I don't love that, but you, you get the idea. Um, other times, I will, I will either just randomly hear something in my head, um, as you know, in the shower. The shower is a good spot for me. Um, I, I come up with a lot of great ideas. You know, they talk about shower thoughts. They, they ain't kidding, man. I come up with a lot of my ideas in the shower. Um, or just, you know, some, on a walk, just randomly driving, random places. Um, and I'll just hear a melody and immediately I'll, I'll, I'll bring it back. I'll sing it into, I sing a lot of my stuff into voice memos. Um, but, uh, yeah, or I will kind of have some riff in mind. I'll figure it out on the keyboard and then I'll just start singing over it. Uh, and, and a lot of times my melodies, even if it's not a melody that actually is like, even if it's not a vocal piece, a lot of times um, I will figure out the melody by just starting to sing over it. Because I, I naturally, I think as, a, as uh, something of maybe more of an inherent pop artist, I don't know, um, a, a lot of times I, I'm more easily able to figure out a melody um, just if I let my my voice just start to figure stuff out and sing over things and and not have to because at that point then I'm not really thinking about the scale as much you know what I mean I'm not thinking about oh maybe I should hit this note like at that point it's just my voice I'm letting my voice lead um, but uh, but yeah I guess I guess that's that's the long answer um, it's different every time but I guess that's kind of how I I I, I form. I guess you could say unique melodies. Again, you consume so much different music, and you kind of just create your own, um, your own palette from that. Your own um, petri dish of uh, of of music, uh, or, or of yeah, uh, and you kind of create your own style that way. So, um, since you've beaten Xenoblade Three, what are your favorite songs from it? Oh man, uh. Here's here's my favorite one. Here's my favorite one. I'm gonna show it to you guys right now. Um, you know what I realized though? Here, let me add. Let me. Add, I need to add. Give me a second. I'm gonna add an audio input so that I can show you guys this. Uh, add a new source. Add source. Okay. Device needs to be Safari. Okay. That may have done it. Let me check loopback. Sorry, guys. Hold on. I will. I will answer that question momentarily. Where is loopback? Thank you. Um, is it on? Yes, it is. Okay. All right. So, hopefully, if I pull this up, um, new window. All right. Let me. Let me pull this up. Yeah, check it out. Uh, YouTube.com. Uh, I believe it's... Oh, crap. What's the name of it? Xenoblade Chronicles... Uh, we'll say flute theme. I want to show you guys this. This is killer. Main flute theme. Yeah, this is uh, A Life Set On. That's the name of it. This song is crazy. All right, hopefully you guys can hear this. I'll turn it down a little bit. This song is insane, but there's a specific part. I'm going to start it here. This song gets me every freaking time, man. Great melody. And great counter melody. Right? Here's your second phrase.
Great players, too. And then, so this is when it gets good. All right, check this out, check this out. That kills me every time, man. Listen again, listen again, sorry. I get so hyped. Relative minor. Oh! Okay. That ki oh, that's, it's the best thing. Um. Let me... Right? So instead of going... What they kind of established beforehand is this... This, this sus4 to major, right? On the, on the G. But instead what they do here... Is they go down a relative minor. I, dude, I, I love relative minors. So... They go down to the E minor, um, E minor 7, which an E minor 7 is literally a G triad on top of an E, right? So it, sus4, G, but instead let's move down the bass to E. So that's already awesome, right? But it only gets better from there, so, so it goes, uh, let's see. That's gorgeous. And and I'm not even gonna try and explain the music theory of this. It's just the the harmon the reharmonization here is just gorgeous. And then I think uh what does it do after that? Um What does it do after that? It it mods up, it's so gorgeous. Hold on. Uh, there there it was, there it was. Okay. Yeah, so it goes. Oh. Yeah, anyway, it's really that one movement, but oh my god, that kills me every time. In the context of the game, in certain scenes, dude, it breaks me. Like, I, I just, I become undone by it, dude. It's so good. Um, that movement is just, because basically, the brilliance of this, and, and, and I feel like I should, I should say this. I think harmony, at least like reharmonizing it like that, has a lot more uh, I feel I feel like people don't talk about this as much. It has a lot more weight when you establish uh, another initial harmonization of it, right? So the first time around, it does not play that that um it it plays something different, right? Right, which this is very beautiful. That's gorgeous, but it also it's it's a little simpler, and it it, it also it it's simpler, and it it it, may, it it tunes your ear to think, oh, that's what's gonna happen in the in the next go around, right? Oh, now things are getting bigger, so you think it'll do this whole thing again, but instead, oh. Oh! Whoa! Right? And so it holds so much more weight that way when 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 you have you've established the melody, but then the second time or the third time around or something, you actually switch it up. Uh, I think that's way better than you know, a lot of jazz people love to like harmonize crazy stuff. Uh I say jazz people, that's that's a horrible generalization. Just in general, I think there's a lot of people that um, will uh, they immediately start to try and do crazy fancy harmonies uh, under a melody? And and I'm honestly guilty. I've done this myself. 
Um, where a lot of times I think it has a lot more impact if you establish something um, perhaps a little more basic, uh, if not if not basic, just establish one thing, but then kind of catch the ear off guard, uh, d not in a jarring way, but just like oh oh that's different, and it 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 especially depending on how you play it out, you can really really grab the emotion of the of the listener that way without them even noticing. Um, so yeah, that's gotta be my favorite track off Xenoblade 3. Fantastic, fantastic. Um, uh, all right, sorry, there's so many questions. Um, I, I apologize. Uh, I will try and, uh, sorry, I'm catching up here. Um, Thank you guys for tuning in. Is tracking guitars more expensive than buying a third-party mini guitar plugin? Man, the honest truth is I don't want to get mini guitars. Um, I would far rather... Uh, I, I think there are a lot of libraries where I can totally... Um, I'm totally cool to, you know, just use the library uh, instead of getting a player. Um, honestly, I, if, if I could have it my way, I'd get real players all the time, obviously, but sometimes the budget does not, uh, account for that. Um, but the one instrument that pretty much no matter what, I will always get a real player on. Um, and I insist basically if, if, if somebody's like, uh, e either I will just try and write something to work around not having a guitarist for something, or again, if they're like, yeah, we need like a punk rock thing all right, I'm getting a guitarist. Like, I'm just, I'm not going to do MIDI guitars on that kind of thing. Um, mi MIDI guitars, no matter what, MIDI stuff just in terms of, guitar, like, guitar libraries uh, in the electric guitar realm, um, just don't, uh, no matter how hard they try, it's just, it's, I, I would always prefer to get an actual guitarist. Um, in terms of, the cost, I, I think ultimately it would probably technically cost you less to get a library because say you spend 150, 200 bucks on a library, you can reuse that time and time again as opposed to spending $200 on a guitarist every single time. Um, but again, for my money, I, I, I'd rather do that no matter what. Um, gu guitars are just, they're one thing that Number one, there's some of the most it's some of the most accessible players and some of the most accessible like it's it's one of the easiest things to get a player on, other than maybe bass. Uh, so, you know, I, I I think it's I think it's worth it. So, um, uh, will you do will you be doing any more songs based on Plunder Phonics? Thanks for the awesome Zelda mixes. Hey, thank you. Um, will I be doing more? Uh, yeah, probably. I mean, it, it's just, it's really just a matter of if I hear it. You know, those were never, like, the Zelda one and the, and the Xenoblade one were not like, oh, like, I should, I should throw, I think I just kind of was like, hey, wouldn't it be fun if we, like, also spliced in, uh, you know, uh, voice clips and whatnot, um, you know, and then it just turned into a, uh, oh gosh, what's the name of the, uh, it starts with a P, right? Like the 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 famous guy that's done like a ton of those, like especially like from movies and whatnot. Totally blanking on his name right now, but yeah, it was. I, I'm I'm sure there will be more of those, yeah. Because like if I if I hear it like in the song, then I'll be like, oh yeah, like let's let's throw it in, let's do it. Um. But uh, yeah, sorry. I know I'm like probably ten minutes behind on 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 the questions being put in chat here. Um. Uh, what's the first genre of music you fell in love with? Uh, rock, rock music for sure. Um, my dad was in the uh, CCM, um, contemporary Christian music. Sorry, I I say CCM, and then a lot of people ask me, and I forget that that's not like just a a, a term everybody knows. Um, yeah, my dad was in that industry, and um. He he played for the likes of uh, bands like uh, DC Talk, um, and so naturally uh, some 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 of my first uh, some of the first things I was exposed to was 
you know, legitimately like grunge rock and whatnot. Um, and, uh, and, and like punk rock and stuff. So rock music is definitely probably the first genre that I fell in love with. Michael Jackson was also very early on. When I was younger, Beat It was my favorite song of Michael's, uh, which again is telling of, you know, the first genre I was really into. Um, but obviously as time went on, that changed. Uh, Beat It's obviously, I still love Beat It, but that, um, anyway, yeah, Michael Jackson was definitely uh, an early favorite for me, which obviously also has never gone away. I think it's very clear both my rock and Michael Jackson influences. Um, but uh, but yeah, as time went on, especially once I got my hands on screen by Michael Jackson, as I've already talked to you guys about, I think both a mixture of that and video game music uh, started to open me up to R&B and jazz a lot more. And so, you know, the way I put it is I'm I'm a I'm a rocker who's really into R&B and jazz. That's I feel like that's kind of that's that's my style. Um but uh yeah so uh what monitors would you recommend for mixing and mastering uh so i'll be honest with you i'm just freaking using jbl's uh what is it like jbl 350 is that what they're yeah and i don't even remember <laughs> dude i won't even lie um when it comes to like speakers, I am I, I haven't really been in the market for like I haven't put a lot of effort into that. And the and the reason is because I've been in an apartment and I haven't wanted to just try and acoustically treat this whole room when I know I'm gonna be moving out of it and then I'm gonna have to pay to have it all cleaned up, right? Um and so really ninety percent of my mixing is on the cans. Um I do most of it in, in headphones. Uh, and the headphones I use are uh, Audio-Technica ATH, uh, ATH uh, M50Xs. Uh, they're kind of industry standard for studio um, headphones. Uh, they're really great simply because they have a really flat response. They're very flat and they're very, they have a really high dynamic range, um, which is really good. You don't want bass heavy headphones. Uh, you don't want treble heavy. You want, you want as flat of a response as you can get uh, because that will help you, um, just, you know, have a better understanding of, of everything you're listening to. Um, so, uh, yeah, I, I, I would say if you don't, it's very important that your room is, it's honestly pretty important that your room is fairly well treated. If you're going to be mixing on monitors, I have monitors. I do listen on them. Really what I do is I mix 90% of the mix is in my headphones and then I just make sure it doesn't sound like garbage in the room you know because again this room is not treated well at all so there's a lot of boominess in here which is not good but basically if I can vibe with the track in a crappy room which is how most people will be listening to it then I know it's good to go I always test my mixes on the phone and I always test my test my mixes in this room I uh, oftentimes I will play it and then go into another room and see how it sounds. Are things cutting through and, and, and still are clear listening in another room? Uh, and then the other place that I always test is the car. Um, it's very important that stuff feels good in the car because uh, so many people are going to be listening in the car uh, and so many people are going to be listening on the phone. So it's very important that the mix is cut through there. But yeah, I'm probably doing most of my mixing. Honestly, I, I, I feel like I can't really recommend good monitors um, because I have not actively tried um, making that work um, just because of my room situation. Uh, once I'm in a better living situation and I've like I own my house and I'm able to just do whatever I want with the room, then you know, come back to me and you know a couple of years we'll talk. Um, but as it stands right now, yeah, I would honestly I, I I'm mixing most everything in the cans so. Um, uh, how to make melodies steal? <laughs> Listen, th there was a saying once, uh, good artists borrow, great artists steal. And it's very true. I think people, they, they, they mix it up. And I think a lot of people immediately read that as, um, plagiarism. Uh, here's what it is. It's you steal an idea, you make it your own. You add your own twist to it, you apply it in a totally new way, right? 
Uh, an example, uh, I'm going to bring him into the picture again. I just, I love the guy, so of course I am. Dave Grohl. Uh, at some point in the past couple years, had an interview with Pharrell Williams um, and admitted that he literally, you know, the classic uh, Smells Like Team Spirit. That whole thing. He said, I straight up lifted that... Um, that flam fill, right? That thing from Gap Band, uh, which was a disco band from the '70s. They opened their their they did opening drum fills, right? And so he just literally lifted that, but it's how he did it, right? Yes, he essentially stole that fill, but what he did is he stole it. Number one, the way he plays it is different because he has a different feel. And number two, it's applied in a totally new way. Uh, I would not say Smells Like Teen Spirit is a disco joint, right? So it's 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 that kind of stuff where you take an idea from one place, take an idea from another place, take this idea from this place, and then you throw it all together and you've created a totally new sound. And, and that's the beauty of art, you know? So do you like Billie Eilish music? Yes, Billie Eilish is fantastic. I love Billie, Billie Eilish. Um, how do you grow better ears for music production? Um, golly. I mean, I, I th this is the lamest answer ever, but a lot of it is just through experience. I think, um, you know, my ear is far better now at, at listening for things and knowing what I'm listening for uh, versus uh, back, say, you know, uh, even five years, two years ago. Um, I think some of it is, um, okay, so as an example, um, I used to always, and I still do, I use this EQ all the time, just the basic channel visual, this is like a visual EQ um, from Logic, right? Uh, the problem is that a lot of the time I, I started becoming more familiar with a shape as opposed to what it was even doing. Right, so I would, I would, I would. Okay, so that makes it sound sharper if if the shape is like this, right? Or oh, whoa, that's a way almost deeper. It's a scoop sound if I pull it back like that, and if I do this, wow, now it's boomier. Okay, so instead of really understanding what these frequencies were doing, I was just looking at the the visual aspect of it, and so I started. I I really started leaning into my. Uh, I started trusting my eyes more than my ears, which you don't want to do. It's good to be able to see what you're doing, but you need to trust your ears more than your eyes. Um, so I think um, once I really started getting my hands on on you know other EQs, one of my go-to EQs uh, is um, the SSL E channel. Um, you know, you don't have any visual like, you know, if I if I set this this right here is about the same, the same thing as doing this. I guess this would really be more like this, wouldn't it? it it's about, it's about the same as doing that. I guess I need to turn this off. Now, obviously they have totally different sounds and that's part of what, anyway, but because I had to fit, like I actually sat here and had to realize, oh, this is what this is doing. Once you start to actually under have an innate understanding of what certain things are doing, I think it helps you tune your ear better to it. And again, the other thing I think that's very, very important is actually um, using your ears to listen to things, not your eyes. Um, don't mix with your eyes, mix with your ears. A lot of people have said that, it's, it's very true. Again, there's obviously a reason that we have our vision and we have visuals because we do need to see what we're doing but we need to be listening more than looking at what we're doing, uh, if that makes any sense. Um, so, um, so yeah, I guess that's one way I could answer that. I feel like there's probably a better answer out there for that. Uh, but like, basically, that's just my answer that comes right off the top of my head when I think about ways that I have improved being able to listen for things and knowing oh, this is what this does, and this is why I should either turn this up, turn this down, adjust this, right, all that kind of stuff. Um, 
you know, like I guess as another quick example, for the longest time I go into the compressor and then I would just go to a preset. Listen, presets are dope. Honestly, I love I love presets. They help a lot. But the problem was I was never figuring out what these actually were doing. I never like for for a good long while, I I I kind of I would I would mess with the knobs if if it wasn't quite where I wanted it obviously, which I usually did. Um but even then there were still a lot of points where I messed with the knobs till I until it sounded right, but I didn't really know what any of the knobs were doing. Uh and even to this day, I can't I I probably could describe to you what all these knobs are doing, but I'm not a very technical person. Uh, so it's harder for me to like really well, very well articulate what these knobs are doing, but I know for myself what they're doing. You know what I mean? I know I have an innate understanding of when I turn up the ratio, this is what's gonna happen. When I turn down or up the threshold, this is what's gonna happen. Um, you know, uh, if I turn up the release, I know what kind of thing it's going to do to the sound, right? So it's very important to understand, I think, what these things are doing. Uh, again, don't turn it into a technical mess in your brain. Uh, you need to be mixing creatively uh, and, 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 and writing creatively and producing creatively, not technically. Um, but having an innate understanding of these kinds of things really goes a long way, I think. So... Again, I'm sure there's probably a better answer out there, but that's the first thing that comes to my mind. Um, what kind of software would you recommend for composing and putting things together? Man, it's it's really to each their own kind of situation. It's really whatever works best for your workflow and your brain. Um, for me personally, uh, Logic Pro is the perfect um, answer to my creative workflow. Um, it just It's always been fantastic for me. I'm a huge fan of Logic Pro. I think it's a gr I think it's great for composing. Um, but uh, some buddies of mine that are that don't that use uh, James Landino uses Ableton Live. He's brilliant. He's an absolutely fantastic composer. Um, T Lopes uses FL Studio, uh, and I, I think we all can agree he's a very respectable and brilliant composer in his own right. Um, so. I'm hearing a lot of noise. <laughs> Somebody must be banging something up out uh, in the outside hall. Um, so yeah, um, I would say um, uh, that um, it, it's really it's really what whatever works best with your creative workflow. I I might just kind of look. I would say, you know, there's Ableton Live, there's FL Studio, there's Logic Pro, there's Pro Tools. I don't know if I recommend Pro Tools. Uh, and I think most people would tell you this. It's it's kind of the the Photoshop of the um, music production realm. Uh, if you understand what that means at all, if not, you can look into it yourself. Um, you know, there's Reaper. Um, there's uh, Studio One. So I might just look into all of these uh, DAWs um, and just maybe just determine which one makes the most sense to your brain and and how you would how you function creatively um um let's see all i know is that wait, hold on sorry i'm trying to catch up i'm so sorry if i missed your question by the way i i am definitely a little behind here um can you recommend albums that you listen to lately? Uh, yes, absolutely. Let me, I'm gonna pull up, I'm gonna pull up my music. Uh, now it's a little bit of a mess right now uh, because um, I, redirect, I, I redirected my entire library to a drive so it wasn't taking up so much space. So as a result, there is a whole lot of crap in here um, that is not recent at all. It says last three months, no it's not. Um, Everything I know about love, I, I don't. Act, I'm so sorry. I don't know how to say her name. Is it Lofi? Laufi? Uh, this is a really, really remarkable record. Fragile is amazing, amazing tune. Um, you can see I was listening to Room for Squares again by John Mayer. I guess I just didn't have the record, so I got it. This is this Room for Squares is amazing. Um, Stories is just a little group of rotating musicians uh, headed by Ryan Lerman. Um, I think it's headed by him. 
Um, particularly uh, their cover of Dua Lipa's Love Again. Big fan of. Really, really awesome. I would definitely check that out. It has a lot of like Nirvana undertones in, in its har harmonics, which I'm all... any. Any time that anybody does anything harmonically similar to how Kurt Cobain would, I am all down. I, I, I've always loved the way that Kurt Cobain uh, would uh, write his melodies and, and his harmonies. Uh, Ginger Root, just a lot of fun. Um, he's just like, he, he's, he's shamelessly ripping the, like the lo-fi city pop vibe. Um, Madison Cunningham, holy crap. Uh, maybe one of the greatest songs I've heard this year common language um i would definitely check this out um again I, I would honestly even play this music um but i just i i don't want to waste time here um but common language is oh my god it's got to be one of my favorite songs of this year this whole record is fantastic though um yeah the entire album is really amazing um beyonce's renaissance Pretty freaking good. I obviously I didn't get the whole record. I only got a couple of tracks. Virgo's Groove, I'm a huge fan of. The production on that track is remarkable. Uh, and now I'm gonna scroll way, way down here. Uh, okay, 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 okay. Here we go. Um, this this is a old. I think this was an anime opening. Uh, Joshua Typoli turned me on to this. Uh, Yoko Kano. Kano, I, I'm so sorry if I, again, I'm bad at pronouncing names. Um, she wrote it. She's a legend. She's, you know, one of what she, she was, she's pretty much behind all the cowboy bebop music. That's pretty much all you need to know. Uh, but she's brilliant. This track is really cool. Um, I guess th these are not albums that I'm mentioning at the moment last, um, but yeah, this, this is amazing. Awesome string arrangement, really, really cool harmonically, chord progressions, all that kind of stuff. Really, really cool. Um, Monica Martin, really, really amazing. Uh, her song "Cruel," big fan of. Um, I became familiar with Phoebe Bridgers recently. I love her song "Kyoto." This whole record's pretty cool. Um, Scary Pockets, another you know group that does a lot of covers and music all the time. They're fun. Uh, Joji's, uh, well, not this, but uh, I mean, that's a good, that's got some glimpse of us. Everybody knows it, but I'm a big fan of it. Anyway, I think that's the long and short of it. Um, yeah. Um, so yeah. Uh, do you have any tips or tricks for when you write rhythm guitars? I often find it hard to have a specific sound on my head when I'm stuck with crappy MIDI guitars. Yeah, I hear pretty much everything in my brain uh, most of the time with that stuff. I'm I am thinking I'm not a guitarist, so even sometimes I'll take it to a guitarist and be like, "Hey, is this even realistic?" Uh, but I mean, most of the time I'm I'm just thinking about like, yeah, it's it's all I'm I'm not really I'm not really trying to figure out any guitar riffs on a keyboard. I'm pretty much hearing all of it out. And then I'll just play in something that's close um, when and when I send like a rough demo to an actual guitarist. Um, uh, but yeah, most of the time with that kind of stuff, I'm I'm just kind of uh, thinking about it in my brain. Um, I, I guess again, a really good um, really good practice would be just to listen to a lot of tracks in the style of whatever you're going for. Uh, that you think do a great job that you really like um, you know say like I don't know for instance if you're writing a a rock tune and you're trying to figure out a good rhythm guitar part um, you know go and listen to rock songs that you love um, and and listen to the rhythm guitar part and how it's playing and just get like listen to a lot of stuff don't even necessarily start to analyze it just listen to a lot of stuff I think a lot of times naturally subconsciously certain things will just start to make sense in your brain you'll start to actually just think more about here's how to play uh, here's how i want this guitar part to sound based on prior not based on now having this vocabulary uh of guitar parts and 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 approaches to playing the guitar that you've just been listening to you know, so uh, I think, yeah, I think it's very important. Just listen to a lot of that. Um, 
a lot of w- the kind of style you're going for. Um, because, because yeah, again, I'm not really writing 90% of the guitar riffs I write. I'm, I'm hearing in my head. I'm not like figuring it out on a keyboard because it just doesn't, it doesn't really, you know, they don't really, um, there's not too many similarities between the piano and the guitar, um, you know, in terms of the way they're played. So, um, sorry, again, I know I'm like way behind here. Um, thank you guys so much for tuning in. Um, really appreciate it. Uh, let's see. Um, what do you look for when sampling music? I think it depends. Um, you know, a lot of, a lot of times, um, a lot of what I'm writing is, um, like, like, I guess, okay, so for instance, like, if you're asking from, like, like the video game remix standpoint, which I'm sure you are, because, because that's a lot of what people know me for on this channel, um, or at least they're familiar with it, um, in terms of that, um, I think I'm just trying to find something that, um, like, I really like the movement, um, or I like a lot of the colors in it, and I want to be able to, like, grab little bits of that and then piece it, like, almost, like, take it apart like a puzzle and then piece it back together in a different way. Um, you know, there, like, a lot of people, like, I, I know, I think I brought this up before, but a lot of people have been like, oh, uh, like, it's, it's, it's very flattering, but a lot of people will, like, comment, like, man, there's nothing Garrett can't remix. He can turn anything into a banger. I appreciate it. That's not true. Um, I am kind of cherry picking, um, because a lot of times people are like, yo, flip this, this would be really cool. And the reality is I just, a lot of times I'm like, I just don't hear anything with that. I don't, I don't like, if I hear a sample or a sound from something and, and it's different for every person, somebody else might hear that and immediately be like, oh, that'd be really cool if I flipped it in this way. Uh, but for me, a lot of times, uh, I, you know, people want me to flip something and I'm like, I just don't hear anything in this that like I can work with. Um, and so, um, you know, I, I definitely think a lot of it is just immediately like hearing something and being like, oh, that's a cool little bit. What if I loop this? Or again, what if I took this apart and then pieced it together in a different order? You know, um, that kind of thing. Um, but uh but yeah, I don't know. It's 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 tough to answer. Um, but I think it also it all it also depends. Like sometimes I'll sample things, um, uh, or or I'll take you know like free royalty samples, say, um, and um, and I'll 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 be looking for something specific because I want like a certain color uh, amongst. A, a, a piece of production I'm working on um, and um, y- you know and and what I'm saying is like a lot of this stuff is not like being deliberately like oh I want this to be an obvious sample that's used uh, as like people hear this and they're like oh that's that like a lot of times I'm literally taking stuff that I can splice up and kind of add like an, another color texture to a song um, so a lot of times it's like I'm what it is is I'm like thinking like oh I'm totally looking for this or I'm looking for this kind of groove or this kind of feel or it'd be really cool if like a lot of times what's cool about sampling is the color the texture of the sample sound like oh it's a unique sound because I've sped it up or I've slowed it down or I'm splicing it up you know so um yeah I don't know if that answers the question at all but that's 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 the best way I guess I could answer it I don't know um, where did the red alert sample come from in the borderline forever? Dude, I'm going to be totally honest. I don't even know. I don't remember. I, I've, I have, I have garnered up. I have stockpiled so many samples that a lot of stuff. I don't even remember where I got it from. Um, I, I, I'm so sorry that that is my answer. I wish I could give you a better answer, but that's, that's the answer. I don't, I don't remember. Um, uh um if 
I have to post something related to music, I guess I'd ask, what's your opinion on autotune? Thank you for the kind words, Bakugan Ray. Uh, what are my opinions on autotune? I think it's good for either two, it's good for two reasons. Uh, it's good to be used as a tool to correct minor mistakes uh, or little little issues, or it's good to be used as an effect. Anything in between those two, I am not down with. Um, I definitely use Autotune slash Melodyne. Um, you know, uh, a lot of times, um, for instance, uh, the beauty of some like like I know honestly, you're probably I say Melodyne, Autotune is kind of just become a general like term uh, as opposed to the actual name of the tool. Um, a lot of times I use Autotune or I tune a vocal. Uh, because um, sometimes it's really close, it's right there, but there was one thing that was a little flat or a little sharp, um, or maybe you know a few notes throughout. Or again, they sent me the stuff. I I'm not in the studio with them, and I can't you know I can't sit there and be like, mm, it's a little pitchy. Let's do that one more time. Um, you know, that's when it's very useful. Um, it's a great tool. Uh, you know, again. Even then, I think as a producer, you have to be able to have an ear to understand, don't make it so perfect that like it's uncanny. You know, like pe people pick up on when something is too perfect, right? Um, because then it's robotic. Uh, and too many times I hear, uh, and a lot of times people don't even care if we're honest, you know? There's a lot of times where stuff is auto-tuned, not to the point which it's in effect, but so much so that it's like every note they're singing perfectly in pitch, uh, and it's too perfect, and that bugs me. I don't like that. Um, I'm not. I'm not a fan of that. Um, but um, uh, yeah, I think it's a, it's definitely a great tool when either you're on a budget, you you're running out of time. It's you know as uh, my dad has even talked about this, how he uh, he said is like. It's more important I get a good performance than good pitch. I can fix pitch. I can't fix performance. And it's true. Um, you know, I, there are a lot of points in which um, Autotune is very useful for that kind of stuff. But again, I think it's important for us as, as the producers to understand that even if we're going to tune something, we need to do it in a delicate way that doesn't completely ruin the reality of it. Um, you know, the truth is, and I think Scott Wozniak, well, Scott the Woz will fully admit this he's not the best singer um i'm tuning him a lot um but the way that i tune him i try to still make it number one because it's co comical but number two because I, I still want him to sound like a real guy that's just singing right so even though i'm tuning him i don't want it to be that noticeable if at all right i want people to hear it and and, and think he's just he's just singing you know that should always be the goal when tuning anybody. Uh, you know, uh, I guess it, for different styles call for different things, right? Sometimes you want to tune it a little more. Um, again, with Scott, it's all so comical that some of the charm of it is that he's, it's not supposed to be, it shouldn't be perfectly in tune. Um, but, um, but you know, it, it does really bug me, especially let's say as for an example, uh, a lot of heavy metal music now, a lot of rock music now. They 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 auto tune these people. They pitch correct them too much to the point which you lose the raw human feel of it, um, and and it kind of just dist a lot of the emotional connection that one should hopefully have with with that kind of music. I feel like it's lost uh, because it gets so computerized. Um, again, I'm not even saying that you can't use auto tune there. But these producers need to be a lot more careful that it's only to fix it so that it's not like this jarringly sharp or flat note. It's not there to put it perfectly at, at you know, right on the grid. You know what I mean? That's when it bugs me. Uh, again, as an effect also, it's cool. I, I actually, it's, you know, if we go T-Pain on it, that's fun, you know? Um, but yeah, it's it's kind of that middle middle-ish ground where it's like, it's so strong that it's you can notice it and it feels computerized but not strong enough that it sounds like an effect 
Um, that's that's the area code in which I, I'm not down with auto tune, and they really those those kind of people really need they need to lay off the tool. They need they need to you you just we have to be able to understand you know when when you've gone too far with it, I guess. So, um, uh, what's your personal thoughts on chiptune music like SNES and Genesis? Uh, I love it. I, I think a lot of some of the greatest soundtracks I think ever written were back from that time. Um, and a lot of it is also, you know, these these composers did such a great job of figuring out how to work with their limitations, and I think it bred uh, perhaps some of the best music as a result. Um, you know, I honestly think that maybe one of the, uh, maybe Koji Kondo's greatest work, at least it's up there, uh, in my opinion, is uh, A Link to the Past. I, I definitely think that's one of, if not his greatest uh, piece of work for a Zelda game. Uh, obviously to each their own, but that personally I feel like that's that that was him at his best. Um, you know, uh, and then you've got Final Fantasy VI. That might be uh, Uematsu's best Final Fantasy soundtrack, and and again, in my opinion, uh, that is so such a brilliant soundtrack. The melodies, the harmonies, everything about that soundtrack, I just feel like is probably his best. Um, you know, and then on the Genesis side of things, you've got freaking Sonic Three and Knuckles, which is unbelievably amazing how how well they they arrange the arrangements um the production on that is so well done with the limitations that they had they just it was so great so yeah i'm a huge fan of 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 that kind of stuff generally speaking less a fan of the nes chiptune stuff just because even i'm again i'm still very impressed that they're pulling off what they can with just bleeps and bloops they did a very fantastic job Obviously, that's where we got the original Zelda theme and the original Mario theme, which have become iconic, as well as numerous other iconic themes. Um, they came from that era. But if I'm going to listen to stuff, I'm generally not going to be listening to uh, NES music. Um, I'm just, it's, yeah, it's, I'm, I don't really want to listen to bleeps and bloops, honestly. Um, you know, most of most of the most brilliant songs of that era have been rearranged many, many times over, either by the composers themselves for a newer game, or you know, literally, or or like cover artists, whatever it may be. So most of the time, I'd rather listen to um, to that instead of the original. But yeah, anyway, yes, short answer. I, I, I'm a big fan of, of chip two music, uh, and SNES and Genesis. And it's, I, and, and I know I made a video on this in the past. It's actually really, really great, uh, to learn, um, arranging, um, to, to, studying that kind of music actually can really help one have a better understanding of arranging music. Um, so, uh, uh sorry guys again i'm catching up again uh, apolog uh, apologies if i um apologies if i missed your question um have you ever created a song 100 percent without using real instruments but only with mouse and keyboard yes um almost the entirety of beat demon is that um obviously there's guitar in there from bennett roach uh, and there is saxophone from Zo uh, Joe Zieja, Zieja uh, who you guys actually, might, some of you guys know this, but fun fact, um, Joe is now a fairly successful um, voice actor who's, uh, you know, done voices of characters like Claude, uh, that's his name, right? And Final, uh, excuse me, not Final Fantasy, uh, Fire Emblem, Three Houses. Um, but, uh... Yeah, sorry. What was what was the question again? I'm, I've already forgot. Oh yeah, with only mouse and keyboard. Yes. Otherwise, bro, literally, I did not have a MIDI controller for both Edge of the Universe and um, Beat Demon. So you want to know what I did? You want to know what I did? Uh, look at this. Look at this. Well, actually, it's right here. I did musical typing, which means. You can't hear it on here. I think it's because 
There we go, there we go. So this is on my keyboard. Yeah, so this is literally... This is literally what I did for both Edge of the Universe and Beat Demon. I would play it in here, and then I would go into the MIDI, and I would just pretty much adjust and, and tweak everything. Because pretty much anything I played in here did, just did not really sound great once you played it back. It just, it did, because it was, so I would tweak things in the in the MIDI roll, um, uh, which for those of you that don't know what that is, it is this guy. So if I, if I were to, if I were to do this, right, so now I've got all these notes here, and I had a flam there, I screwed up. But yeah, you've got you've got all these notes here, and then you can pretty much right. I can I can I can switch the, right. I we could right. You can do something like that. So that's the MIDI roll. I I spent a lot of beat demon and edge of the universe in this area right here. So, uh, and fun fact, T. Lopes uh, actually was not great with the piano, as far as I'm, now, I, you may need confirmation from him on this, but I'm pretty sure T. Lopes did, like, most of, if not all of, like, the Sonic Mania soundtrack by doing this, by, by writing in stuff, that kind of crap, and then editing it, because I, I don't think he really could play the piano. So he literally like wrote in and programmed in pretty much everything. So, um, and and yes, it it fooled me too. He he is, he is incredible. He is a master. Um, so, uh, do you think sampling can become stealing items? If it goes too far, in most cases I think it's fine, but then you have Vanilla Ice just straight up using the opening to under pressure. Yeah, I mean, yeah, I, I, I think like, I, yes, I think there are instances in which you are, you are using so much of the identity of another song that I at the least bit you need to pay like you, there needs to be royalties, right? And so like Vanilla Ice's situation, I kind of like, yes, that one kind of makes sense. Um, but there's so many times where people get all up in arms about this stuff and I truly believe sampling is uh, again very similar to what I was talking about earlier which is that art really is just stealing somebody like a whole bunch of other people's ideas and, and creating something new with it uh, and then somebody else will steal your idea and steal a whole bunch of other ideas that they've heard and then create something new with that as well you know I really think that's pretty much what art is um, and so people that get very, very uptight about sampling, it just doesn't make any sense to me. Um, I, well, okay, let, let me, let me, let me put on the brakes for a second. It does make sense to me for one reason, and it's the fact that it is, generally speaking, the actual sound recording that that other person played. So, you know, I guess the, the key difference, if we go back to my point earlier about Dave Grohl stealing, quote unquote, the Gap Band's opening drum fill, I, the key difference there would be if they actually sampled the drum fill from whatever that tune was by Gap Band in Smells Like Teen Spirit. Some people would not be down with that because it's like, well, you didn't even play this. Um, you just literally ripped the sound recording and so I can understand where sometimes people can get upset about that. But I still personally feel like sampling is just like any other part of the art where, yeah, you're totally taking somebody else's idea, but you're applying it in a new and totally different way. Um, you know, again, if it's so deliberately, like, like using the identity of, of whatever song it's lifting um, that it's sampling um, then I can definitely understand people being upset about that I think I would be upset if you know somebody I don't know sampled uh, get along 
and pretty much just deliberately used the hook and didn't change anything about it and just maybe added on a little beat and then like had you know then i would kind of be like all right i kind of want cash for that you know but you know if if they were i maybe i'm about to dig myself a grave by saying this but like if somebody were to grab like say the opening guitar part and then they grab different parts of it and splice it up and it's like a whole bunch of splice stuff and then it's part of a whole a greater whole of something that they create and it's just an extra color or something i really don't think that i i don't i don't think i could be up in arms about that and i don't think other people in other scenarios should either i, I that's one of those where i feel like you have taken an idea and you turn it into your own thing and completely twist, like changed it and made it your own. Uh, and in that regard, I, I really don't think that there's much of an issue. Um, and, and and a lot of times I feel like people that get up in arms about that are just looking for cash. Um, it's even more, I, I even more so disagree with it when, uh, again, like you take an idea, but it's not even the, that sound recording. You're just taking the idea, but then completely applying it in a new way. But you played it and everything again like that's but that's another conversation anyway that's that's kind of how i feel about it personally um so uh yeah i don't know if this quite counts but if you were to revisit b demon today what would you change about it oh man that's a tough one to answer uh, i think a lot of people know uh in hindsight i most of b demon i don't love anymore uh, i kind of cringe at most of it uh, however, I say that, and I always, I always clarify though. Listen, if you love the record, don't feel like I'm glad you do. Don't let how I feel about my own music affect how you feel about it. Because here's the thing. Here's kind of what I've realized. Well, not what what I've realized. Th this is kind of, and I, I've had this conversation quite a few times recently, where I've I've basically said, listen, music, my albums, that's my journal. I don't do a dear diary, right? The, my albums that is my journal um and so um you know some of it is from a technical perspective a lot of it i look back at b demon i'm like man i could have like i could uh, this production could have been better i could have arranged that better i could have mixed that better right um you know this verse could have been shorter i should have clarified the way that i sung that lyric all that kind of stuff but i think a lot of it also is i look back at that and i see you know 17 year old edgelord garrett and that was that time in my life and so you know it's it's one of those where it's like it's kind of hard for me to listen to now because it's that was a point in my life that i'm not at anymore um you know and you know the same goes for middle of somewhere you know i'm uh, already i'm feeling it but i i know especially in the next five years that i'm gonna be like you know like I, I, I'm sure I'll feel better about that record from a technical perspective. It'll be way easier to listen to it just from a from an objective standpoint, I guess. Um, but I also know that I probably won't relate with it the same. I, I won't, you know, that was music that I wrote and released at that time in my life because that's where I was at. Um, and that's the beautiful thing about music is that it stands the test of time in that way where somebody else can pick up, you know, beat demon or Edge of the Universe, for example, now, and really love it, um, and it'd be really important to their to, to them in their life and where they are in, in their life now, um, even though when I wrote it, it was important to me eight, 10 years ago, but now I don't have any connection to it. Anyway, the only reason I say all of this is to preface that I don't think I would revisit Beat Demon. Um, I feel like that was a time in my life that I, I just, I don't, I, and I think the other element of it, though, is that because on top of that, the technical, the production stuff, it makes it hard for me to want to revisit it because, um, I, I don't know, something about the way I wrote that music and everything, it's just, it, it, that one's a lot more difficult for me to revisit now, um, or, or, or even consider, I, I feel like if I were to revisit now, I would just completely do it over entirely, and then it would be a totally different record, you know what I mean? Um, and that's not, you know, then it's not Beat Demon, you know what I mean? So, um, yeah, I guess that's my answer, but the thing is, I have thought about revisiting Edge of the Universe. Um, but even then, 
if I were to revisit Edge of the Universe, I would definitely be adjusting lyrics. I would be changing some of the arrangements. I would be completely replaying everything and reproducing everything. Uh, and in that sense, it kind of beca- it sort of becomes a new record. Um, you know, uh, so yeah, I don't know. Uh, what was the number one song of the day of your birth? I have no clue. I don't know. Let's, let's see right now. Number, number one billboard song, April 14th, 1997. U.S. number one song in April 14th, 1997. Can't Nobody Hold Me Down by Puff Daddy? Was that really number one? That's amazing. Oh man, All For You was the number one on my fourth birthday dog. Yeah, it was number one on my seventh, dude. I grew up in the I grew up in in the in the right era. Holy crap. No scrubs on dude. Oh my god. These are all bangers. All my life. Oh my god, dude. It's no wonder I am the way that I am. But Puff Daddy, I guess, was number one on the day I was born. That's crazy. Um I see Paul McCartney on there. Paul McCartney is my my favorite songwriter of all time. Period. Now, a lot of why I love him is also what he did in the Beatles. Like, the Beatles are my favorite. Paul McCartney by himself, I don't love as much as the Beatles. But Paul McCartney in the Beatles, and then Paul McCartney as a solo artist, I like him over all the other Beatles as solo artists. And he's my favorite of the Beatles. So, Paul McCartney is easily my favorite songwriter of all time. So... Um, is there a website you'd recommend for getting samples or a DJ pool you may recommend Re- recommend uh, recommend uh, definitely check out Splice um, Splice is awesome because y- it's literally just a giant collect now I will say their search engine is butt and it logged me out okay don't know why that's fun guess I'm gonna have to do that again um, but, uh, yeah, Splice is a banger. Um, it's search engine is butt, but it's fantastic. Um, because there's just so, I, I get a lot of stuff from Splice. Um, but I also get, I don't know. I find a lot of random packs over the course of time. Um, yeah, I don't know. It's, 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 but I, yeah, I would say my first answer is Splice. Um, Splice is fantastic. Um, you do have to pay a monthly subscription. I think it's like eight bucks a month uh, for like a hundred credits. Uh, but mine is built up over time. Uh, I rarely do I use over a hundred credits a month unless I'm buying tons of packs. Uh, so I've just accumulated a lot of credits, uh, and so it's it's really not a big deal for me. But I think if you pay more, you get more credits per month. Um, uh, thoughts on talk boxes, dude? I love talk boxes. Uh, dude, I, bro, like five to six years ago, maybe even longer, I was like super determined to like get like an old DX100, uh, which was like the staple synth for like doing talk box and, uh, and then get an actual talk box. I never did it. Um, and I think part of the reason I didn't is because, in fact, actually, this is probably more like seven or eight years ago. This was like following Beat Demon. Cause I remember I was like, dude, talk boxes need to make a comeback. I'm totally going to get a talk box. So I think I started like thinking about like saving up like a, a bit of cash for it. And then you want to know what happened? 24K Magic came out. And I went, well, now there's no, like, I, it literally for me, I was like, well, they got to it first. So, cause then, and then at that point I was just like, well, now I just feel like if I do anything, it's just going to be, I'm just going to sound like I'm, I'm, you know, on the hype train of talk boxes after 24K Magic. So I, uh, yeah, I, after that, I think I gave up on it, but for a while I was really intentional. I was like really intending to get a talk box. Um, uh, what would you consider your best work and why? 
Get Along is definitely up there. Uh, for for a while, I've been saying that's probably the, my favorite, and I think it still is. Um, Get Along, just because of er everything about that, I'm very proud of the songwriting on it. Um, I'm very, very proud of the production and mix on that. Um, that I just, that song, at least at the moment, until I eventually better it, or at least personally feel like I, I, I did. And, you know, I think the older I get, the the less I'm worried about one-upping myself. For a long time, I really was concerned about that. Um, but I think uh, the older I get, the more I just know I learn more as I as I go on. My, my music will change. My style will evolve. And I, I think, at least at the moment, I'm a little less concerned about one-upping myself. Uh, but that said, I, at the moment, my magnum opus, I think, quote-unquote, is get along uh and yeah it's it's just because i'm i'm super proud of the arrangement the production the mixing everything about that now is there already things that i know i would tweak and, and improve yes um but by and large it's absolutely my proud i, I think i would say it's my proudest work so um What's my favorite type of bread? Sourdough. Sourdough from like the Bay Area. That's the best. That's real sourdough. Um, please play Big Shot from Deltarune. I don't know it. Hi, Garrett. I just got here. I'm wondering if you're planning to upload the stream afterwards. Yes, I believe this stream should be available afterwards. Um, love to know what some of your favorite VSTs are. Um, yes. Okay, sorry. I, like, brain farted for a second. So, I guess my question then becomes... Well, I guess VST probably generally means, like, in, like libraries, right? Instruments, not, like like mix mixing plugins uh if we're talking instruments one of my main go-to is keyscape i use this guy almost every single project almost every single time I love now it's piano I really like I use it a lot um, sometimes it's not what I'm looking for though in which case I will uh, I will actually use addictive keys um, which is another really good one generally the uh, the expression of keyscape is better uh, but if I'm especially if I'm looking for something a little bit uh, more like uh, let me let me put it this way the release time on keyscape is a little unnatural to me oops whoops 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 that's that's addictive keys this is uh keyscape it just feel it's a little um unnatural to me you can adjust it a little bit but it doesn't sound quite right to me so if i were to say natural let's say Right, but yeah, again, if I start to play softer. I realize that this, uh, yeah. Anyway. So it's great when it's softer, uh, but in terms of like, especially if I want to play something a little, I feel like the release time of addictive keys is a little bit more natural, um, you know, so. Um, right, that, I don't know, that just, if I'm playing something more like that, I, I, I would probably reach for addictive keys. That said, 
Also, Addictive Keys has got uh, Fantastic uh, Upright in it as well. And what uh, another thing I love about Addictive Keys, it's more um, editable. It's it's you can you can adjust it more than Keyscape. Keyscape, you you don't have nearly as many parameters. It's it's kind of this the sound you get is kind of you get what you get. Addictive Keys is a lot more. You can actually turn it into a totally different sound if you want to. Uh, so you know, but they've got presets here that are really fun to play with. Funky uptight, it's like totally unrealistic, but a lot of fun. Right? Right, that whole thing. Anyway, so like you've got, you've got fun stuff like that. Um, you know, I love Death Row. I don't have... Right? That, like, that doesn't even sound like a piano anymore. Anyway, so, yeah. I take too long to answer questions here. Uh, Addictive Keys, big fan of. Um, huge fan of Omnisphere. I use this guy all the time. Oh, you know what? I probably should have kept it. Hold on. I use this guy all the time, though. I, Omnisphere is is um, a beauty. I, I, I really do use Omnisphere all the time. Uh, Serum is good to use, especially if you're doing more like hard-hitting uh, electronic sounding stuff. Serum is fantastic. Um, you know, this guy. Um, there's a lot, you know, I've got a lot of patches in here, but you know, it's, they're all really cool, you know. Just crazy crap. Like, it's just killer stuff. Anyway, Serum's awesome. I use Serum a lot. Um, what else do I use? Those are probably some of the ones I use the absolute most. Uh, I, I mean, I use Contact all the time. Um, it's got a lot of great, you know, stuff in it. Um, you know, there's a Scarby pre-bass that I use a lot. I use this guy a lot. Uh, Scarby Rickenbacker, that one's pretty good. Um, and then, yeah, when I'm going for the more orchestral stuff, I mean, it's it's a given. I'm using Contact. I'm using uh, CSS is a big... I use this guy a lot. This one's gorgeous. Really fantastic. Um, anyway, yeah. I would say that's probably some of my main go-to stuff. Uh, I use the sampler a lot. I use Logic Sampler a lot. Uh, I mean, you guys know me in sampling. Um, so yeah, I'm using that guy a lot. Um, you know, back in the day, I used to use the living crap out of ES1. I know this, it, it's an ancient GUI. It looks like garbage, but it, I mean, it, it's, it's fun. Um, you know, uh, yeah, I would say that the, yeah, I'm getting a little sidetracked, but those are probably some of my like absolute first go-tos in terms of like instrument VSTs. Um, so, um, uh, yeah. What do you think of, like, sampling a voice line from, like, a show or movie and using it in hip-hop? I mean, I think that's a lot of fun. I, I love that. Um, uh, what's up, David? What's your favorite? We know your favorite beetle, but what's your favorite beetle? Stag beetle, for sure. Um, what's your favorite synth you own or dream synth you'd want to own? Uh, probably my favorite synth that I... Oh, gosh. So, of the synthesizers I own, uh, I, I, I don't know if you're asking just hardware synths or if you're also talking about uh, software synths. Definitely my favorite software synth is Omnisphere, bar none. Um, but if, uh, in terms of hardware synths, 
I've got, I really have three. Um, I've got the DX7, I've got the Roland XV5080, and I've got the Virus, um, the Virus B, uh, Access Virus B. Um, the Virus B is the newest edition. Uh, probably the DX7, because I just, I, I love the, the, the kind of gritty, dirty tone it's got. Um, and very percussive tone that it has as well. It's also just a classic sound. Um, uh, in terms of synths that I really want though, um, one that I grew up with, uh, and I and and I know this probably sounds crazy, but um, you know, again, my dad was a producer, is a producer, um, and uh, and he had it's still sitting in his garage. Um, he had the Korg Triton. Um, and I remember the day he got it. Uh, he got it at this music store that kind of, it, it, it was a big music store for about five years and then just died. I, I think it was just poor business management. Uh, but this big music chain store, I think it was just called Mars. Um, and I remember the day that he got that Triton brand new. This was 2001. So it was like a brand, like the Triton was a brand new synth uh, workstation at this point. Uh, anyway... I I played on that thing a lot, and I asked to play on it because I didn't have my own piano. Uh, I didn't have my own p keyboard. In fact, I'm I'm sure that's part of the reason they got me my own little like Yamaha keyboard because they were like, because Dad was probably sick and tired of me constantly asking to get on his Triton. Anyway, I use when I first when I recorded some of my first music, I actually recorded it in his studio, um, and I used that Triton. So that Triton is very near and dear to my heart. It's it's gotten me a a long way. Um, and I would love to be able to either have his Triton or, or get like a workstation or something. I mean, they're huge. So like, I definitely couldn't fit it in here. Maybe I could fit it somewhere else, but if not like the big keyboard, at least the module, I would love to have that. Cause the Triton's just fantastic. Uh, D50, Roland D50, absolutely love. Um, I don't actually, I have like a soft synth like a VSC of it but I don't actually have the D50 I would love to have the D50 um so yeah I guess that the, the there's a, a few for you um um did you ever play Golden Sun I did not I did not play Golden Sun. A lot. I know a lot of people were super into it, though. Do you ever try other types of art, like drawing, painting, and so on? And if so, how much does it influence your music and vice versa? That's an interesting question. Um, so I know a lot of people are like, oh my god, here it goes again. He's about to say it. Um, if I had not been a musician, I would have been an animator. I was very, very close um to going that route um there was basically i think some point in my high school uh, during high school that i eventually decided i was going to go into music and and not into animation um but i was very i mean i i had been i i sketched and and drew all the way back from like three years old um and i absolutely loved it and honestly I've been talking with my sister-in-law and we're talking about like, like actually just starting up, like, I don't know, just doing it as a hobby again. Cause I need another creative outlet and I haven't really, um, I haven't really, uh, done a lot of drawing, a lot of sketching or anything, but animation was absolutely like, I was this close to that, to going that direction in my career. Um, but, um, how much it, it, it affects my music is an interesting question. Cause I, I, I will say this for sure. Animation and especially like video games and whatnot, um, obviously have had a huge effect on what I have decided to do in terms of music. Um, you know, I, it was kind of, I fell in love with music and I fell in love with video games and I realized, wait, there are people that get hired to make music for video games. Oh my God, that is perfect. Um, and, um, so, you know, there's that, um, 
I definitely, I definitely, I'll tell you this. It's tough. It's tough to say. Well, okay, okay, okay. I, 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 <laughs> I'm trying to figure out how to answer this question. I, I, I'll say this. When I first started getting into video game music composition, a lot of the way that I actually, I think, improved in practice, even if I didn't realize I was, is that I kind of started coming up with my own video games, my own video game ideas, my own video game characters, right? I had this ability to draw, so I would come up, I would draw, I would sketch out all these ideas for video games in hopes that maybe one day I, that I would actually make them happen. And on top of that, I would actually, I would write music to every level I thought of. I would write music to every story beat. Um, and I feel like that was very important to helping me uh, get better at writing video game music. Um, and so um, I, I think in that regard, at that, that would be a way in which that kind of thing definitely affected um, how, how I write music and how I approach it. Um, you know, I'm also, I'm always very, very, uh, I'm very visually inspired. Uh, you know, whenever I talk, when, whenever I'm working with a company and they're like, hey, we want um, we want you to uh, or w whatever it is like, hey, OK, we want you to do music for this level for this character, just for this game in general. OK, what I always tell them is any character design art you have, any level design art you have, any information on the characters, any any backstory, anything you can give me. Now, obviously, it becomes a little overwhelming if you give me the the giant you know 500 page novel on it but give me all of that information give me all the visuals that i can possibly get um because that will help me exponentially and help inspire me to know exactly how i should go about writing the music for this so um so yeah i definitely i i i don't know yeah i i i, I guess i guess that would be at least in terms of me and animation and art and whatnot that that's definitely an area in which i i'm it, it's it's um played into uh, my music um so yeah i don't know um <laughs> what's up Shark lord sorry again i apologize if i'm i'm answering very slowly here what's up zark flappy sheep um have you ever checked out vital uh i'm believe I'm familiar with it, but I, I, no, I don't use it. Um, how can I make drums with no drum kit? Uh, I mean, what do you mean? Like, are you asking how do you, how do you put drums in a song if, if you can't record drums? Nice name, by the way. I like it. Billy Jean. It's a good song. It's a great song. It's an amazing song. Um, yeah, so I mean like so let me just go ahead and show you here um, You know, this is basically if you if you've got a DAW and logic they have a built-in um, Well here, we'll just do this and logic. They have a built-in uh, Drum VST and it's actually not bad. It's actually pretty good um, and um, You know Right, and, and of course, I'm, I'm, because I'm a drummer, I have a little bit of an easier time being able to, uh, like, come up with something. But, I mean, yeah, you, if you've got, they, you, they've got um, libraries for this, and they've got these samples, right? And so literally what I can do is, we can start with the kick. Right? do something like that and then we could loop it so i'm going to quantize it a little bit though i actually like to generally not keep it like at a perfect it, it there's more realism to it and it feels a little bit better if you don't have it quantized perfectly right okay so we'll say that's the kick i use fl studio i'm sure it's either if it doesn't have a built-in vst you can you can find one if you just look up like good drum vsts i you i'm sure there'll be something good um, and then, and then here's my snare, whoops. Right, something like that. 
quantize it a little bit, turn down the quantize strength. And then, right, so I do it piece by piece. And the reason I do it piece by piece is I want all of these elements separated so when I mix, I'm able to manually, I'm able to control really like how you would actually generally control an actual kit where you would have all your close mics, your overhead mics, all your different mics, I have more control over, over all of it, right? So then I can, you've got your kick here, right? I can turn up the kick, turn down the snare, right? I wouldn't do that, honestly, but right, maybe turn this down, pan it over this way. Right, and I can change, like they, they also give me different snare sounds here. Um, Oh, I guess I, 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 I'm on the, uh, I'm on the wrong. Right. And so there, you know, now you essentially have a, a little beat. Right, you know, but having like a good understanding of how the drums work, how, how drummers play, and then going off that will will help exponentially in like being able to create like a, 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 a good and convincing, or at least just a good feeling drum groove, if not convincing, right? It doesn't always have to be convincing in terms of like realism or something. Um, but yeah, so. Uh, but yeah, I'm sure if you look up like good drum VSTs for FL Studio, I'm sure you, you'll find something. Um, I, I, I th addictive drums, I know is good. A lot of people talk about addictive drums. I don't have it, but I've heard a lot about it. So uh, maybe, maybe you can start there. Uh, what games have you made music for? Uh, I have done music for uh, No Straight Roads, Encore Edition. Um, I've done music for PUBG Mobile. Um, and uh, some just Tencent stuff in general. Um, so uh, yeah, I've also done music for uh, Asaga Academy. Uh, that's a bit of an older one. Um, yeah, I guess that, that's a couple examples. I've done music for a few different visual novels. Um, and there's a lot of stuff that I either have in the works that I can't talk about. Um, or, uh, you know, I, I, I've actually told people this a lot, but uh, it's actually a miracle how many games even get out. Um, that I've been, I've been hired, been paid, and done a lot of music for a lot of things that never see the light of day. Because uh, uh, it's actually pretty remarkable how hard it is to, to, you know, finish and release games a lot of the time. So, but yeah, I guess that's, the, those are a few, like, notable games that I've, I've composed for, um, among others. So... How did you make the outro for Scott the Waz? Uh, oh, the zip, oh gosh. That's a that's a big can of worms. I don't know how I'd answer that. Um, really, Scott was just asking, um, I, I remember when he contacted me about it, he was like, I just want it to sound like you, like quintessential Garrett Williamson. Um, and so he was like, like literally his reference point was get along, um, which I thought was, funny so he was like just do something that sounds like get along um but for the breakout theme uh and so that's essentially what i did i i think i just kind of went by my instincts at, at that point um and just approached it sort of similarly um that's the short answer so what projects would you like to do in the future man i would love i did music for in mmorpg um, that's probably all I can say. Uh, unfortunately, the whole thing, I think, kind of fell apart. Um, but I did music for it, and I had a blast working on that music. I would love um, to um, to move forward uh, with more MMORPG kind of stuff. That stuff is fun. Racing games, I'd love to do more for. I'd love to do music for more racing games. Um but yeah, I'd say like RPG related stuff, JRPG, that kind of thing. I'd love to do more of that kind of thing for sure. Um, Cause I, I, I absolutely love that kind of stuff. So <laughs> David, 
<laughs> yeah, I was. Yep. 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 What advice? Uh, what advice would you give to someone wanting to get into music production and composition for scoring games, shows, etc.? Um, get involved with the with the community of people that are really um really into the same thing that you are right so i made a lot of connections i think a lot of the work that i've been able to find has been based on uh connecting with people that you know sh sh like I, it's it's all a domino effect it's you know i i met one person that led me to another person that led me to another person etc cetera, etc cetera. and it i mean we're we're, we're tracing back uh, essentially 10 years here if not more um but you know it started for me with meeting a lot of people um uh either online or in person um that were into the same kinds of uh the same kind of music the same kind of games the same kind of genres and styles and stuff as me um and so um you know i think that's that's a very I think it's very important that you you start to connect with people in that community. Um and honestly, you know, a lot of those people in that community find the people that are trying to really like make a fan game or you know, maybe this is dangerous talk because Nintendo hates this crap, but I you know, I think in this day and age a lot of a lot of people are a lot of notable composers come from a background of uh, having connected and worked on fan games or uh, you know mods or whatnot. Um, you know, I think I think that actually is very um, that can be very helpful in connecting with you know other people that are determined and you know have the skill set or at least are working hard to gain this skill set to be legitimate um, people in the industry. And a lot of times those mods and fan games honestly are, you know, good. Um, uh, it's it's a good showcase of one's abilities or, or a group of people's abilities, right? Um, and a lot of those people end up getting hired as a result. So, um, so yeah. Um, I guess I guess that's a few things um that I would say um but yeah no c connecting with people in the in those communities and and I guess the other part of you know the the other huge advantage of do, doing mod like being a part of a mod or, or a, a um a fan game is that you start to build experience and understand? Oh, okay. So this is how this is how we should do this. This is why this works. You know, I mean, a lot of the a lot of the people that I I work with now that are very legitimate and are in the industry. Um, you know, uh, James Landino, Funk Fiction, uh, Falk uh, Ah Young. I'm so sorry, Falk, if I screwed your last name, um, screwed up your last name there. Um, all these people started with like, uh, you know, I think some of, some of the first stuff to their name was like Sonic after the sequel. Um, and then they went on to, you know, do stuff like uh, Spark the Electric Gesture, which then turned into, you know, Falk started doing stuff for like Kingdom Hearts. And then he was doing stuff for uh, Sonic Mania. And then, you know, he's, and then they're doing stuff for No Straight Roads, you know? So it's, uh, I, I think that's another really great place to start for sure. So... Um, we well, not sure what version of logic you have. I have 10.6. I have not up and it's because I am still on uh, I think it's Catalina, right? Yeah, I'm still on Ca Catalina. I'm not on uh, Mac OS 11. Um, the uh, Mac OS 11, uh, I, I believe still supports like newer versions of logic, but uh, the latest version that Catalina supports is 10.6. So, um, so yeah, I'm on 10.6. Um, But I believe you can pick multi-output on, on the drum kit designer. Yeah, I don't know if... I don't know if this is uh, an option here. That might be a newer version, or maybe I've missed it. 
Um, I don't know. Um, how long did it take you from seeing the new Frontiers trailer than making the new Frontiers track? That song's my personal favorite. Hey, thank you. Uh, huge shout outs to Adrian, uh, Adrian Taylor uh, for that bass part. I'm telling you, man, I mean this. When I sent it to him, I was like, I I'm not totally feeling this. I remember I sent it to Chase Akers, who played guitar on it. I sent it to him, I was like, how do you feel about this? I'm just not totally feeling it. He's like, no, dude, it's totally great. I'm like, okay. But I still was like, I just don't know. I sent it to Adrian, I was like, dude, ignore my bass part. Play whatever you, like, just play what comes to your mind. He sent it back, and I heard his bass part, and I went, oh my god, now it's, now it's good. Now, now I vibe with this 100%. He, for me, he made that track. Adrian made that track. He wrote that bass part and he killed it. Um, so huge shout outs to Adrian. Also huge shout outs to Chase. Chase Akers heard his bass track and went, dude, I want to throw a guitar part on that. He did and it just, yeah, it was amazing. So um, yeah, I don't know. I think I heard that and pretty immediately was like, oh, this would be fun to flip. I, I should flip this. This would be a fun one. I don't think it took too long uh, for me to want to turn it around, like to, to flip it, so. Yeah, uh, I can't tell you exactly how long. I don't remember, but I don't think it was very long. I, I think I pretty quickly was like, "Oh, yo, uh, let's." Fl I, I want to flip this. So, thanks for the advice. Really great. Yeah, no problem. Um, I'm not playing Wonderwall. <laughs> yeah. So. You get really incredible stuff when people are just allowed to do whatever they want. That's really cool. Yeah, I, I, I should, I should, you know, that's an, that's an interesting um, point that I'd, I'd like to actually kind of make, is that um, I really, really believe that um, I think it's very important as a producer and as a songwriter that you let. I, I think now let, let me okay let me say this real quick. When it's orchestral stuff, those players are looking for something that's very specifically written out, right? They, they, they. In that instance, you're you have a lot more. The the composer and arranger are are a lot more integral to the entire, like just to exactly what notes are played in what way, right? But when it comes to like the rhythm section, for instance, I feel like it's very important that. As a producer, for the producer, it, it is the producer's job to steer the ship a certain way. To go, this is what we, this is the goal, this is what I'm hearing, this is like where it should go. But I think it's, I think it's very important, maybe equally as important, that you let the other musicians bring what their their part to the table, because every person has a totally different idea. They have a totally different. Um, maybe uh, they have a totally different approach to the overarching narrative right um i think the the, the greatest way uh, the great the greatest creative collaboration is when you have a, a similar goal but you let everybody kind of flourish and approach things in their way and a lot of times it's back and forth. They play something, then you suddenly go, wait, that's sick. Hold on, I have an idea. What if you did this based on what you just did, right? Um, that happens a lot. And then maybe they'll be like, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, what if I did this instead? And it's this beautiful back and forth thing. Um, and so I think it's very, very important that you let, as the producer, again, you're steering the, 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 the ship, but let the, the players express themselves let them you know a lot of times really honestly let them if they have an idea you you should re like really lean into it at least for a second and then you know if it's not working that's all good we tried it let's go a different approach now um i think that's so important i, I don't i don't love when producers are so anal about like and like controlling every little bit of it that like you know they're not letting the the players have any part in the process and at that point you know it's it some sometimes i think there are there's never like i, I can't say it's a rule i think there are exceptions where 
you do kind of want to be like, mm, this is the part I'm hearing, and, and I, I, I need it to sound more like this, right? Um, and I, I absolutely will do that. But again, it's all still with the goal of, I have hired you to be the player on this because you have a unique way of going about these things, and I want you to apply the way that you do these things to, to this piece. You bring something unique that I don't bring, that I cannot bring to the table, and it creates this, again, this, this beautiful marriage of all these different ideas um, and I, I, yeah, I, I, I think it's very important that you you leave a good amount of breathing room for the players uh, and, and anybody else involved um, to, to let them, you know, bring their ideas and, and their approach to the table. So um, have you ever tried FL Studio? If you if so, what do you think of it? Uh, it's not really my thing. Um, again, it, every DAW is really, it's it's whatever works best for you. For me personally, it's Logic Pro all the way, every day. Um, I absolutely love Logic Pro. Sure, it does, you know, it'll crash or give me weird issues from time to time and I'll get irritated. What app doesn't do that? Um, but honestly, all, all things considered, at least Logic Pro 10.6 is really pretty freaking stable and I, I, I don't run into too many issues too often. Most of the time, the issues I run into are with a third-party plugin and not Logic itself. So, uh, I love Logic Pro. FL Studio is cool. You know, there's a lot of really respectable, fantastic composers and, and producers that use it. it. It really is whatever works best for you. Um, but for me personally, I don't care too much for FL Studio. I'm a Logic Pro guy. So, uh, how do you approach composing for a video game differently from making a song? Um, there's a lot of different elements. Um, with video game music, a, a, a big thing is that um, you are... Th there's a lot. I, I think with, with video game music, number one, you are helping to... Uh, the, the composer is generally helping to um, better the experience for both the player and to um, fully realize the director slash the developer in general, their vision for the game. Um, most of the time with video game music, you're not writing music for yourself. Um, you're not writing music um, generally with the intent of expressing, um, you know, uh, I, I don't know. I think, I think you can, obvi you obviously do express yourself in, in the music, obviously, but it's all about helping to realize the full vision um, from an audible perspective uh, for a game, uh, for a scene, for a level, for a character, for a menu, whatever it is. Um, that That is the job of the composer is to audibly realize the full vision, the emotion needed, the, the vibe, the aesthetic, whatever it is of the video game. Um, other elements that make it different is that video game music is generally supposed to be adaptive music, which means that it will change based on whatever the player is doing, right? It's what makes it a, a more fascinating challenge to me and something I'm far more interested in, generally speaking, than film composing, because you're generally writing music um, where you need to make it work to, number one, it needs to loop seamlessly, uh, number two, there needs to be various versions of the song, maybe, for when it's really chill and you're just exploring, but then, oh, now it's the same song, but we're adding in more aggressive elements because now we're fighting someone, right? Uh, but now we need to figure out how to transition it seamlessly between the two, that kind of stuff. Um, that is a lot of the, the, the difference between writing video game music versus just writing a song, where with a song, you're just kind of... Um, you know, I'm just, I'm writing whatever uh, I'm feeling, you know, whatever inspires me in that moment, uh, you know, a tune that I hear. Um, and it's it's really, you know, generally when I'm writing a song, especially if, again, it's just my own song uh, and not for somebody else, um, you know, that stuff is, is generally for me. Now, again, obviously I also do write songs for video games. So for instance, like a main theme um, you know, I recently, uh, wrote a theme song for, um, a visual novel called I Just Want to Be Single, 
Um, the game's not out yet. Um, but, uh, you know, that's more of writing an actual song. Um, but you're still... the Still the whole point is director gives me references, style, aesthetic. This is the goal. This is the emotion we want to go for. I need to achieve that, right? I am not just writing something that is just like, this is what I'm... This is like my vibe today. Unless the director literally was like, have at it, just write whatever you feel makes the most sense here. I have no, I don't care at all what the style or anything is, which rarely happens, rarely. Um, but, um, but yeah, I guess that's kind of the long, that's the detailed answer I would give on some key differences between like writing a song and writing video game music. So, um, Studio One just works best for me. Yeah, and I've heard a lot of people love Studio One. Is it worth it to pirate music softwares? I would not encourage doing that. Um, especially in the case of something like Logic Pro or Ableton or anything. These are fantastic DAWs that I think I think they should be supported. Um, you know, we should support them by giving them money and you know, hopefully they'll give us a, a better and more stable product as a result. Um, I've never been one to uh, really be cool with pirating things, generally speaking. Um, so, yeah. And that's another conversation for another time. So. Just got here, so I don't know if this has been asked, but when I write music, especially if it's upon, uh, like, a first draft, I find myself using the same chords and key. Does that often happen to you? Yes. Um, I do find myself, like, r my hands, I think, very often um, will just immediately play, like, you know, like, whoops, well, I'm on my drum. Uh, why am I not hearing anything? Oh, 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 oh. Oh, never mind, still not hearing anything. Hello. There we go. Yeah, a lot of times I'll literally, I'll just be like, all right, let's write a song. I'll, I'll like do that every freaking time. So like nowadays, yeah, I, like I'm so self-aware of that that I'm like most of the time now, if I do use that progression, I'm way more like, I'm like, okay, only in this spot. <laughs> Cause yes, I do, I do find myself, um, going back to chord progressions that I've used too many times. I love them, but I've used them way too often. Um, you know, and I think to some extent, sometimes it's fine, especially if you come up with a new melody over it, you know, like it's part of our vocabulary. It's totally cool to reuse chord progressions all the time. It's, it's totally okay. But I do try to challenge myself and keep myself from doing that too often because yes, then I'm just recycling the same crap over and over again. Um, but you know, it's funny, my buddy Joshua Typoli, he's very familiar with my music at this point. We work so often together and he'll just start to call out stuff that I do. He's like, Oh, that's a Garrett Williamson move right there. Like, he's like, that's such a, you would, you would do that. Like, it's funny. And it, and it goes the, the, the other way around too. He'll send me stuff. I'm like, yeah, that's such a Joshua move. You know, we just have these things that we start to like, we, we like it and we just kind of like, just gravitate toward it. Um, but yeah, again, I, I, I do definitely, I'm conscious of those things that I do. And I, I, these days I definitely try to be a little more careful about it. Um, so, um, you know, sometimes that might literally mean, so again, with like, right with that chord progression, I maybe I, I might be like, oh, well, I heard something cool, but that gummit, I use that all the time. So maybe what I'll do is like, well, I'll just, I'll, I don't know. Let's, let's say like, I don't know. Like I'll start to try and figure out, well, what harmonically will work that's similar to that progression, but maybe it's like a backdoor, right? Or like a reharm of it. Right, so I, I don't know. I don't know what I would do here, but like you could do something like. Um, and then, and then from there, so okay, just like 
actually verbalizing as I'm going through this, right? I could say... Right? And, and now we're, now it's actually a little different because now just my ears led me somewhere else. Um, right? Oh, that's different. That's, that's almost whack. Maybe we just go up. just do oh that was it yeah right so like now now I've actually kind of come up with something different by by like if I started here but then I was like well let's do something more interesting Gary you do that all the time right well we can start with this bass but we, we can start with this basis this is home base, right? Or whatever, but how about instead I turn it into a 7 sus 4 by moving the, the bass note up up here. Uh, yeah, and then and then I'm just starting to get more. Anyway, so that's one way to go about it, I guess. Um, Reaper is cheap, and a lot of people love Reaper. A lot of people actually sing its praises, so. Um, do you listen to any metal or just aggressive heavy music in general? Um, oh, dude, I, like I love, I love hard rock. I do like quite a bit of metal. I'm not as big into like newer metal stuff. Uh, it's it's hard to say um because um yeah it's it's kind of hard to say um cuz there is quite a bit of like newer metal stuff that I I I I dig but like I I love I've always been again like somebody asked me earlier well like what was the first genre that you really fell in love with that you you really gravitated towards and I said rock rock music hard rock grunge rock um, you know, punk rock, um, shoegaze. Oh yeah. I'm definitely familiar with shoegaze. Um, shoegaze a lot of times is a little too muddy to my ears. It's just too much like washed effects, but I really respect and, 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 and like the genre because of how it's affected other genres. So like I, I've seen shoegaze find its way into, you know, like again, say some like punk rock or alternative rock. Um, and what it does is then you get these really cool kind of textures underneath, but with a more prominent, like, main guitar riff in front of it, where a lot of times I feel like Shoegaze is just a lot of, like, just crazy effects and not a lot of song. Um, at least from a lot of the music that I've listened to, uh, a, lo a lot of the Shoegaze music that I've listened to, but I definitely very much respect and, and appreciate shoegaze for for kind of how it's affected other genres um but uh but yeah i mean yeah i i i love i love a lot of uh heavier rock music i'm 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 definitely big into that so um yeah i'm you know i mean some of my favorite bands are like like Nirvana, Rage Against the Machine, Soundgarden, Love Soundgarden, you know. So. Yeah. Um, yeah, anyway. Uh, all right, well, it's been over two hours now. Uh, I probably need to wrap it up here. If anybody has any more music questions, get them out now. Because um, I'm probably going to wrap up here momentarily. Um, but I do really appreciate you guys being here and tuning in. Thank you so much. Um, you guys, you guys are the best. Appreciate it. Uh, yeah, this stream should be available, uh, to watch back 
um, once I uh, once I conclude it, it, it should be available. Um, but uh, but yeah, once more, if you have any uh, any other questions now, now is the time to ask before before I call it because you know I don't know the next time I'll I'll do um, a stream like this though. So, Hopefully, I'd like to try and stream a little bit more often to this channel, if I can. Um, but, yeah. Do I like musicals? Generally, no. Generally, I'm really not. Um, I do not like musicals. Uh, there are some, like, exceptions. Like, I really like Sound of Music. Um, there's other ones. That's the first one that comes to mind that I that I, I do really like. But generally, the answer is no. I, I don't really like musicals. Um, which is, uh, you know, too bad for both my wife and my sister because they're both very into Broadway. So, uh, but yeah, I, I, I just, I won't even... Yeah, I won't even give it the time of day. A lot of the time, yeah, I'm not, I'm not big on musicals, so... Um... Yeah. Anyway. All right. Well, thank you guys so much for tuning in. You guys are the best. Appreciate you. Uh, and uh, yeah, I will be... I don't know the next time I'll be live here. But follow me. Hey, follow me on twitch.tv slash gwilly. Uh, if you're not already, go follow me over there. Um, I think that you are going to not regret it. Maybe you will. I don't know. I don't know where I was going with that sentence. Um, but definitely go follow me on twitch.tv slash dwilly. Appreciate you guys. Uh, thank you so much for watching. And I will uh, I will see you guys soon. All right. And remember to subscribe. I never, I never ever bring that up anymore. But rem yeah. Su subscribe to channel. All right. Peace out. <laughs> Thanks for coming by, guys. Bye.